Welcome to the Profitable Painter Podcast. The mission of this podcast is simple, to help you navigate the financial and tax aspects of starting, running, and scaling a professional painting business. From the brushes and ladders to the spreadsheets and balance sheets, we've got you covered. But before we dive in, a quick word of caution. While we strive to provide accurate and up-to-date financial and tax information, nothing you hear on this podcast should be considered as financial advice specifically for you or your business. We're here to share general knowledge and experiences, not to replace the tailored advice you get from a professional financial advisor or tax consultant. We strongly recommend you seeking individualized advice before making any significant financial decisions. This is Daniel, the founder of Bookkeeping for Painters, and today I'm here with John Busick. John Music is a fifth generation painter and third generation owner of Kunst Painting, a premier residential and commercial painting company located in San Rafael, California. John is obsessed with systems, workflows, and customer service. He is WorkGlue's visionary leader and CEO of his third generation family painting company. John originally saw WorkGlue as a simple solution to run his staff of 30 plus painters. It was such a game changer. He wanted to help other business owners reap the benefits of more time out of the office. Hence, Work Glue was born. Today, John continues to be Work Glue's biggest advocate for simplicity, key features, and developing new partners. John lives just outside of San Francisco, California with his wife and two sons. Welcome to the podcast, John. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely glad to have you. Super excited to get into your background. A fifth generation painter. That's that's pretty amazing. What what's the story behind that? Uh story goes back deep. Um apparently we're not very smart people because we just can't get out of it. But um no, I'm just kidding. Um happy to be here. Uh story goes back in the late 1800s my great 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 grandfather was immigrating from Germany to New York from and um headed west and his first job was actually painting rail cars that classic black so he was painting the rail cars as they moved west um eventually landed in San Francisco and uh, became a painter and a grainer there his two sons um actually started manufacturing paint. So we were originally a manufacturing company. They grew it to about 11 stores up and down the state, had a huge factory in downtown San Francisco. Unfortunately, in the 1930s or so, the main factory burned down and um, they kind of lost everything at that point. They didn't have insurance back then. Uh, So my grandfather came back from the uh, Korean War and he and his twin brother started paint contracting. So since then, we've been um, out and about doing uh, paint residential and commercial here in Marin County and San Francisco as well. And we've uh, recently expanded north up to Napa and Sonoma counties. So, Wow. So you must have some really, you must have a huge amount of knowledge in the family on painting. Like you, you went from manufacturing and now you're doing, you're running three generations of painting businesses uh, or of the painting business, which is amazing. Um, what are like some of the key things that you've learned either from your own experience or passed down from your family in terms of systems, workflows, and customer service? Because I know those, I think, are the pillars that have uh, probably shaped your your company's success. What are some like key things that you've learned? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm I'm super grateful, fortunate. I, I realize that um, you know a lot of people that are out there starting their own bi- own business in the painting industry, um, you know, really struggling out there sometimes to to find jobs, find employees, and such. So I inherited a established business. Um, that said, there are other challenges that come with that. Um, Uh, As a lot of people say, business is messy and not easy. So no matter what stage you're in. Um, Some of the things I've learned over time have been passed down to me. That is one of our core values over here is to basically do what you say you're going to do. And um, you should be fine at the end of the day. As long as you do what you say you're going to do and take care of people at the end of the day. um, Good people, good business, good clients will find you and stick with you. 
And I know you mentioned core values. So is that something that you guys have in your, your business that you try to really attract and, and uh, employees like in the traction? I don't know if you're familiar with traction, um, that EOS system. Is that something that you guys employ in the business or? Funny you mention that, Daniel. We are um, actually in the process of taking a deep dive in EOS. We've hired a EOS coach that's um, kind of meeting with our management team and we're going through all that. Um, but taking a step back, my grandfather was was a pioneer. He sat on the national board for PDCA back in the day in the 50s and 60s. Um, in fact, I just went to the national uh, PCA conference and they had some old photos sitting there. And I saw my grandfather sitting at one of those tables, and that was just pretty cool for me to look at those pictures back then and see him. Um, my point to bring that up during the core values, though, is they didn't call them core values back then, but he certainly had them, and and he was kind of a pioneer with uh, with that business thinking. Um, so we've always had these – he called them key principles when, when I grew up. That's what he had kind of listed in our shop, and um, – Three of those key principles are now our core core values, which we call. So um, we've always had them. Now they're just coming to the forefront and we're managing the business around those core values. Okay. It, a lot of folks, you know, at least when I was younger, when someone would say core values, my eyes would kind of glaze over and I didn't really understand how they could be useful or or powerful in the business. Um, what what things have you, I guess, what results have you seen using core values in the business, and and uh, and how do you actually make sure your team is on board with those core values? I I don't think that ever ends. That's a constant massage. Um, that finding different ways to <clears throat> bring those to the forefront. Um, we start every meeting and discuss our core values in different ways. A lot of times it's through a story uh, or something that happened during the week. Uh, say something went something went south on a job and how we corrected it and maybe used one of those core values to, you know, one of them is do what we say we're going to do. So, you know, we screwed up on X, Y, Z. And we fixed it by telling the customer we were going to fix it. And we, we followed through on that. So I think it's um, something that you constantly need to keep your finger on and bring it to the forefront. And through storytelling, I think, is how you avoid kind of the glossy eyed, um, especially so some of your new employees grasp what you're really talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I imagine it would it would help with decision making at the lower level when when they know what the core value is do what you say you're going to do they don't have to ask permission you know they they know what what your take is on that and so uh you know if the salesperson mistakenly said you know we'll paint that for free um or that's included you know in the quote but it wasn't put on the quote uh you know maybe that's can be solved at the lowest level when the production manager knows like hey we said we're going to do this so let's go ahead and fall through and do it even though it might you know, monetarily hurt the business, but we want to follow through with what we said. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're looking for customers for life. Some our, our crew leaders and production managers know that that is, that is absolutely the direction that we want um, that autonomy, that decision-making um, you know, it's a, it's part of the marketing budget, to be honest, uh, you do a good job. Uh, what better dollars are spent on marketing than taking care of customers so they re become repeat and referral? So, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of people don't think of uh, their customers as recurring, you know, revenue uh, in in this business. Anyway, they you know they're very focused on getting the customer and then producing the work, but then after that, it's kind of not you know, now it's the next getting the next customer. So not a lot of attention is, is paid on, Hey, this, this is a, a customer that we're going to keep over the, you know, their lifetime or however long they'll be in the area. Uh, so that seems like that's a deliberate uh, strategy on your part. 
Yeah, absolutely. We've, uh, I, going back to your original question, um, we inherited that mentality. Um, 68% of our business is repeat referral. So it's a heavy, heavy portion of our business. And um, we, we want to continue that because the closing rate on those, as you know, is, is much, much higher and a lot easier. So what's uh what programs do you have in place to make sure customers are reactivated or you know uh turn into customers again uh what do you mean are you talking sops are you talking software or what are you talking about um so do you 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 mentioned that you know make sure we we take care of our customers so that they come back to us later do you have a a system to uh, reach out to them periodically to see if they need help, like, like a direct mail or email or. Yeah, we use, you can use any one of them, but we we chose constant contact. We Mm -hmm. use that. Um, We also have our customer database. Um, I know we're talking about it here, but we use work glue for that, for a customer database and spit that off. There's different categories of how we track people within there. Um, and they become a uh, referral client at that point, and that list gets exported to Constant Contact, and that's how we continue that path. Um, there's other areas to market to existing customers. Um, say it's a residential r- uh, repaint that you finish, so you can mark a date within the system that we've created and follow up two years later, a year later, and say, hey, reaching out is probably a good idea that we do a power wash um, maintenance check on your property. Uh, it's been two years, X, Y, Z. So we kind of put a monthly list together based on finish date of that repaint um, and kind of hit those lists as going forward. Okay. So you have a, a life cycle kind of planned out for a, like an exterior repaint. Um, you know that two years from now, they we should be reaching out to them to to do a pressure wash. And so they're like in a, a constant contact workflow that follows up with them, you know, you know, two years from that point or make sure that we send off that. So that's kind of built into the the system where you have different milestones to reach out to folks depending yeah, exactly. on the project. And most of it's trigger and status of the customer. Um, that's how we kind of track it. There's multiple ways to set that up. Um, I I hire smart people much smarter than me to handle that, um, but oh, that's awesome. Um, since you mentioned Worklu, how did how did Worklu come about? I know I read in in, in the beginning about your bio. Basically, you built Worklu to solve problems that you had in your your current business. So, uh, could you go through? I guess what those problems were. What was Worklu fixing, and how did how did that actually come about? Yeah, good question. Um, When I came into the office, so I was, I went off to college, did the corporate world thing, um, realized that wasn't really my my speed, I wasn't built for that. My father offered me the opportunity to come back into the family business, so I did that. And uh, prior to being able to come into the office, though, he forced me to um, work in the field. Excuse me. (coughs) In working in the field as a crew leader, learn from the uh, bottom up, uh, basically how operations worked and such. Well, as I was going through that process about a year and a half in, our office manager of 15 years, who essentially was every SOP on the back end, um, went out overnight with a um, career-ending illness. And um, I was brought into the office overnight and had to figure out all the systems. Um, we didn't use very much technology back then. This is in the early 2000s, um, still very heavily Microsoft-based. And then we decided, um, I started chipping away at things. I needed a CRM. I needed a timekeeping system. I needed payroll system, accounting, you know, all the buckets that you need to kind of fill to run the business. Well, I started doing all these one-off apps out there. So before I knew it, I was logging into eight different apps, and it became cumbersome, um, difficult to manage my business. Uh, nothing really sank. It was kind of double entry, quadruple entry. So I met a software developer through a friend and, um, here locally in the Bay area. 
and I was kind of telling him exactly what I needed to kind of pair these few things. So he built some custom stuff for me, and um, I had a little, you know, kind of a little hodgepodge system that was married. And um, I was at a PDCA event and a residential forum, and some other painting contractors saw what I was logging into and looking at my business from the computer, and they were like, hey, what is that? And I kind of showed them and they actually forced me to come up and do a little presentation. And half the room was like, how do I get that? You know? So before I knew it, I called my software guy. I had no intention of getting into the software world, but um, I, I said, I think we might have something here. So that's how Workly was born. We brought on a few um, early adopters and, and some investment and, and really kind of grew the product. And I actually, was just using it. And a lot of people, a lot of contractors over the years since then have really built work loop together. So it's built based on the contractor's perspective, which is a really neat thing because I think that's a different perspective when it comes to software today. So. Yeah. And that's, those, those, that's always the best software is where the founder built it to solve his own issues. Uh, so that's it's always refreshing to instead of like an outsider trying to figure out like what's going on and um and so like for example paint scout they you know they were solving their issue with estimating and so they created paint, paint scout which i think uh paint scout and work blue work pretty well together if i'm not mistaken correct yeah yeah okay. john and i over there we we kick things back and forth uh they're a great product great company um work blue does not do estimating uh, we directly sync with back and forth with Paint Scout, so it's kind of a good little mirror um, back and forth, little merge, as well as QuickBooks Online, and that's kind of where you guys come in. So mm -hmm. it's um it's from A to Z through those three systems. Um, obviously, you have some one offs here and there, um, and that's where <clears throat> Zapier comes into play today. Um, but yeah, essentially what Workloo does, what it solves today's problems, your biggest buckets, it's a project management system. So it starts off when you close the deal, it becomes a job. And at that point, you start scheduling either employees or subs in there, start tracking different costs, um, expenses within that. You're communicating in Workloo from the office to the field. We have a mobile app that all the field crews or subs can use, um, and they get all the details of the project find out what they're doing, when, so on and so forth. Um, and from there, so you're scheduling your employees, you're scheduling the job itself. So there's two different schedules, what a lot of people forget to think about. Um, you have your employees that you're scheduling or subs, and then you have the actual job schedule, which is in the future date, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing, Daniel, I'm doing your house in September. I need to get that on the schedule. I don't know who's there yet, but I'm plugging it on there. So work will helps you with that. Um, and then there's a bunch of other bells and whistles in between that help you manage the project from A to Z. Once it closes out, it syncs with QuickBooks online so you can bill it um, and track change orders and stuff like that. That's awesome. So since you've been working with Workload, because it's been, in, you guys have been in business for what, 10 years? <laughs> For a little while, right? Realistically, yeah, probably since 2017 is when we really, really launched. So, mm -hmm. uh, 10 years we've been at it. Yeah. So, uh, what have you seen in terms of numbers? Because I'm sure you, you have a lot of data in work, Lou. What, what does a healthy painting business look like in terms of how much should they be paying for labor or, or materials and that kind of thing? It depends. I mean, a commercial business versus a residential is going to be a little bit different. But um, if you're primarily residential, you're you're anywhere from I see twenty five to thirty five percent labor is kind of a healthy business. Um, around ten to fifteen percent material and sundries are in there. Um, <clears throat> that's tip that's kind of the typical. Obviously, material is going to go up on the commercial side. Labor might drop a little bit more because you're you're offsetting that with maybe equipment that you're renting or anything like that, or assets you might purchase and bill back. Um, but yeah, that's that tends to be the sweet spot for for labor. Um, one thing that I also do track in in my company is uh, sundries and inventory. 
So that kind of syncs up. So when you bill out sundries, we do some larger projects. So sundries do come into play when you're, you know, ordering rolls and rolls and rolls of tape. Those do add up. Mm. But on the average residential project, it, it's probably not even worth tracking almost because it takes too much time to track. So um, that tends so to be the big buckets for me, uh, for what I'm seeing. Um, we could we could get probably pretty into the weeds, but most people probably don't want to hear me talk about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, for for labor, you you said twenty five to thirty five percent for direct labor, like on the job site, the crews on the job site, right? That's what we're talking about there. Correct. Correct. Okay, so I think some people listening might be like, "Wow, that's not a lot at all," because uh, I've seen you know folks pay fifty percent to labor. Uh, and so basically you're the, from what you've seen, healthy painting businesses, they, they're basically their labor is one fourth of the revenue, one fourth to one third of the revenue that they bring in, which is correct. Yeah. Third, you know, 33%, I think is the average, uh, even if you jumped up to 37, I think you're healthy, but if you're in the 50% um, labor range, that is a tough gross profit margin to be working with. Um, don't get me wrong. We Ours does increase during the winter time to keep our guys busy. So we tend to, to knock that GP down. Um, you know, a healthy GP that I'm seeing today, excuse me. <clears throat> a healthy GP that I'm seeing is anywhere around, you know, 40 to 50% is kind of the healthy range that I see really successful painting companies hitting some up to 60%. Mm -hmm. um, anything below that for, for me and my perspective, since I run a painting business is a little dangerous. There's not much room for air. So um, something to be considering, think about. Yeah. That, that makes complete sense. And uh, it does reflect what I see as well. Like, 40% is the minimum gross profit. Like after paying for direct labor, direct materials, 40% needs to be a minimum. Hopefully not shooting for 40% because that's like kind of the, the average. But yeah, 50% is usually at least a starting target. And then um, as you grow and everything, maybe even getting that up to 55 or maybe even 60 for, for some folks. That's, but yeah, that, that definitely reflects what I've seen for sure. Um, and it also depends on your, um, you know, supply and demand, current economy. Like we were, we were trying to hit 60% for the last few years because there were such good years that, you know, you couldn't get to everything. So you wanted to bid things a little bit higher and take the premium. Mm -hmm. um, but now that it's slowly shifted a little bit, now we're shooting for 55, 50. So it kind of depends on the market as well. Yeah. What things have you? have you used in your business to, to get your gross profit to hit, you know, 55 or 60% gross profit? What, what things have you implemented in the business, whether it's systems or software or whatever yeah, it is? I think it's, um, you can use whatever systems you want, as long as you, I think a great starting point is a system. Um, SOPs, if you're into standard operating procedures, those things are something that you're a repeatable process. Um, you want to get those on in writing. You want to get everyone following the same standard operating procedure because then, then it's repeatable. Um, uh, a perfect example for us is checklists. We use checklists within Workloo. And while people are out on their mobile app in the field, we have standard operating procedures for checklists. Say, say we're starting your house to paint your house, Daniel. Our crew leader knows to meet with you. There's a checklist on his app that he clicks each button and rent, writes a note, met with owner. Um, owner's expectations are X, Y, Z. Next question, uh, are what? where should we put our job shop, right? The stuff we're bringing on site. Location takes a picture of that, puts it in the checklist. So it just makes that crew leader follow the questions that we want them answered on day one. Uh, did we find any scratch glass, any broken materials, anything like that? They take the picture and put it in on the checklist. So we kind of have that documented before we even get started. Another one checklist that we have is the closeout process. So how how I want that to roll every single time so we don't skip a step. So I don't personally, as the owner or project manager, have to be on site and make sure that stuff gets done. 
So that's a that's kind of an example of how we use it. Yeah, that that's that's awesome. So basically, they're using workload to go through step by step for each project. They have a checklist they follow, and then they notate, check it off, notate what they did, or would take a picture of of the of where they're storing the uh, the um, tools in between. You know when they're going to come back next. And so, yeah, you, so can, you can you can you can build custom checklists however many you want of whatever stage of project, um, and it's pretty open source, so you can kind of build that. Um, another thing that we do is daily job logs. The crew leader is responsible to put in at the end of the day, take pictures, and and most of them use like the voice microphone on the phone and talk into it about explaining what they got accomplished for that day and what their plan is for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and um, any issues that came up on that day they're supposed to report and any injuries or anything like that, accidents or injuries. So we capture that every day, comes in, we have a daily job log report that we look at at the end of the day or the early next morning. Um, so that way our crews are set up, have everything they need, and um, we continue to check progress. Okay. So basically you're you're preventing issues at you know, we're leaning forward using that checklist to prevent issues, which should make things more efficient, move, makes make sure things move, uh, works uh, more smoothly. And then you have those end of job, end of day job reports, which kind of make sure that we're ready for the next day. It sounds like. Exactly. And for, well, since uh, a large percentage of our, our business is repeat, um, a lot of times we access those job logs going back and saying, hey, you know, six, five, six years down the road, how do we set up that scaffolding? How do we set up the ladder work? Um, and we quickly can look at those pictures back from the previous project and the next time we go. Um, same with managing colors and all that, like everything gets uploaded into the system. So we're much more efficient. We're not matching colors a lot. We keep the formulas on file. Um, another thing that outside of software that keeps us efficient is um, we do weekly crew leader meetings. So mm -hmm. crew leaders report back where they're at on the project. Paint Scout does a phenomenal job of creating the estimate and the work order at the same time. So people know how many hours are estimated on this project and exactly what they're doing with photos to boot. So we, um, we provide those with our crew leaders and hold them accountable. So, so they get the budgeted hours with everything that was put in the proposal in their work order, and then each week you're reviewing. Okay, how did we do on on this job so far? Or maybe it's done already, and you're reviewing. Okay, you, you were budgeted for this. What actually happened? And then you're saying, okay, what are what went wrong? What went right? Is that kind of what what's going on there? Exactly. And we're not perfect. Some guys slip up. Some guys are better than others at reporting. Um, some <clears throat> One thing we really are good at, and uh, people like yourself uh, appreciate that at the end of the month, is uh, we're on top of job costing. So we know exactly where we're at on every single job, every, down to every material receipt. Um, so that process really quick, you can make it pretty slick. Um Say uh, Juan goes to the paint store, picks up uh, five gallons of paint. The receipt comes in the email. It automatically goes into QuickBooks Online. We sync with QuickBooks. That pulls into work loose. So the guy out the field knows exactly what they've spent on material and labor at that second. So hmm. um, today's world is pretty fascinating. It's pretty exciting in the painting business in terms of leveraging technology if you do it right. Um, and it really helps to improve efficiency that I've learned. Mm-hmm. Do you reward your, your crews if, if they come in under budget or anything like that? So we have a uh, bon performance bonus system that um, there's kind of five checks for every job we track for the crew leader. Is the customer happy? It's yes or no. These are mm -hmm. all not subjective. These are just yes or no questions. Um, did they get the job logs in for every single day? Yes or no. Um, were they under under ten percent under budget on hours? Yes or no? And did they get the customer um, feedback? Did they get the? We have a form that we give the customer. It's a customer report card. Did mm -hmm. they get a nine or ten on that? And then the last one is um, 
uh, did they hit their production hours, budgeted production hours for the month as a whole? Meaning, did they work, say they have, you know, 80 hours for two weeks. Did they work the full 80 or did they not work the full 80? Okay. And uh, that, that nine or 10, is that the net promoter score system? Correct. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. okay. Awesome. So they have those five things that they, that they need to hit. Uh, and so if, if you have, do... if you, if you follow EOS, that is their number, right? Those are their KPIs mm -hmm. that they're trying to hit. My production manager is required to hit a certain GP based on all that. Um, so if we're doing our job on the estimating side at a certain gross profit margin that we're bidding and holding our, our production managers accountable to those numbers and he's hitting those numbers and the crew's hitting those numbers, all of us are hitting our number that we're trying to follow. So everyone's moving in the same direction. And uh, is there, so they get like a bonus each month if they quarter we do we do a quarter quarterly time. bonus all of those add up to five points per job so if you're hitting your points every month you can earn up to five percent of your w2 per quarter nice okay that's 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 good all right um so what's uh what what kind of future developments does uh work have going because i know you you guys are constantly improving the the software because i know uh paint scout i think was added in the last year or so and you have integrations with zapier set up is there anything else new features or uh, developments coming down the pike yeah we have a few payroll developments happening payroll syncs with a few different companies uh, direct syncs that are going to be pretty uh, robust and pretty exciting on that end in terms of hr um the so mobile app was the the hours, like syncing hours to payroll? Is that syncing what? hours, vacation time, sick pay. Okay. There's a whole list of other stuff that's going to happen over time. And oh, that's entering awesome. an employee one time and it syncs back and forth. You don't have to enter it in multiple areas. So um, the, the other one that we just released it actually, um, it's pretty exciting. Our mobile app just had a huge update. So... Now you can track uh, access documents and photos within the from the field. So once you, you can make certain documents public to the company, whoever is a user is, or certain uh, kind of hidden. So there's two categories there for the guys out in the field. Now they can pull up any scope of work documents schedule. You know, maybe a designer sent a PDF schedule. You can upload that into Workflow, and the guys in the field can access that. Uh, simple stuff like that. Um, uh, the mobile app also just updated the uh, timekeeping piece to where now there's multiple layers. You can enter the cost codes and stuff like that if you track cost codes. So you can take it an extra deep layer on that. Um, so it's constantly improving. We always have improvements rolling. Our improvements with Paint Scout continue to roll out as well. As they improve, we improve and vice versa. Um, same with QuickBooks Online. QuickBooks continues, Intuit continues to produce better and better uh, APIs out there. So their API is constantly improving, and, and so do we. So, What should folks do if they're interested in reaching out to you or, or to interested in using Workloo in their own business? Yeah, Phil, you can always email me, john, J-O-H-N, at workloo.com. Or you can go to the website, workloo.com, and all you need to do is click on schedule a free demo or training, and um, that will set you up immediately, and you can find out and do a little tour and um, go from there. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I highly recommend Workloo. We have several clients that, that use you guys, and they love the, like you said, the way it integrates with Paint Scout and then also QuickBooks Online, and it keeps their business running. So. Uh, Definitely highly recommend you check out Workloo if you haven't already. And with that, we'll wrap things up here. Love to hear your thoughts in the Grow Your Painting Business Facebook group. If you're not already a member, feel free to go to Facebook, type in Grow Your Painting Business and join the group. Ask questions about uh, Workloo and give any feedback on future podcasts. Love to hear from you. And with that, we will see you next week.